Alright, what's up friends? This is Keith Franks from Cutlass Board Games and today I figured I'd be doing some Blood on the Clock Tower content. I did like an unboxing kind of thing where I went through and talked about the quality of the components, what kind of stuff comes in the box, so if you want to go and check that out first, feel free to. But what we're going to be doing today is a bit of a storytellery boot campy type thing where I'm going to build a couple of trouble brewing games and we're going to talk about what is going to go into it. This is all going to be about racking up a balanced game. One of my personal pet peeves is that you get to the end of the game, they do the roll call and you're like, how could I possibly have won that? So that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to build some stuff, we're going to talk about what kind of things you need for each character to have to have a fair and balanced setup. I've just kind of thrown some things out here. Okay, so this is an interesting setup where none of the townsfolk have each night info, right? You've got a lot of what I call trust building exercises, right? We have the Virgin, which if they manage to actually have their ability activated, then they will have a confirmed good player. The washwoman that finds one friend to trust, the butler that must find one friend to trust, and the mayor that needs to get the trust of the whole town in order to have their ability activate. But then the imp would probably have one of their or two of their bluffs, would be like an each night info character, maybe like Undertaker um, or Empath maybe. And then you would have the spy, which knows that there's like no info characters in the game and has to do their best to make it look like they trust the imp to give them the info on who's in the game without giving it up that that's what their their team is. This is not a setup I would use for beginner players. This is probably not a setup I would use, but I wanted to use this as an example because I want to look at what would potentially happen in this game and then we get to judge whether or not this is a fair game for the good team or the evil team. First of all, the good team has no each night info. <laughs> So with the exception of the Raven Keeper dying, they do the exact same stuff on the first day that they do every other day, which is gonna be really tough for them. So they'll have a really explosive first day, they'll find a few people that they trust, and then the evil team, the spy specifically, will kind of realize that they've got all this information they can kind of add to the town. And depending on how strongly the spy plays, the spy can convince everyone one person is evil, right? But, and they'll, they'll know it's not the washwoman target and they'll know it's not the virgin. So they're probably going to try and put as much shade as they can onto the Slayer, Butler or Raven Keeper. If the spy can convince the town that there is a drunk and that the Butler uh, is evil, that's a free execution. Um, and then if the spy is like, oh, I was an undertaker, the Butler we just executed was, I don't know, a minion, a poisoner or whatever, um, then that would be really, really strong. The spy is like, Keith would never put a butler in the game. And then everyone executes them. Um, and then the spy tells the imp to never kill the person that's the Raven Keeper. And your final day is imp, spy, and Raven Keeper. Now, this is if the spy carries the entire game. If the spy is super duper passive, then it could go very differently. But I still see this as even though the good team has a lot of characters that can dunk really hard that they can just straight up make like really strong trust circles then I think that the evil team will still run away with this because the good team has no definitive information after the first day because the spy and the imp's bluffs could potentially be any each night character they can be like oh this is what we thought at the start but this is what I know now this is what I've been told last night this is what I think is going to be happening so this is not something I would recommend. I think this is an unfair game towards the evil team now, what would I do to change this to be more balanced? I would probably take out the spy. I feel like the spy in a, a small play account game is really, really powerful. I would probably go, I think also a Baron would be like way too powerful. I think Poisoner is better here. See, if we have a look at the Baron in this spot, the Baron replaces two of these characters with people that do nothing, all right? So we have the Drunk, we have the Saint. We now have three active good players. 
that could get info or do things, right? Um, and they would all have to be info characters that like hit good, otherwise they are not doing very well. <laughs> so we have the poisoner. I think the butler is still fine here. Um, I would change the mayor to an info character. I think the virgin is still okay. Virgin is hilarious. Like if they get poisoned, and that's like a really good value. I'd probably take out the Raven Keeper and the Slayer, right? And then what we would put in, we would get an extra First Knight character, and then I would go uh, Empath, probably not Undertaker in such a small game, because they only get two or three Knights info, and that doesn't tell them very much. Like, you have the person that died to the Virgin, the Undertaker goes, okay, sure, I, I knew that you were the chef, or I knew that you were the washwoman, but it doesn't get them anywhere. The only value the Undertaker could get is if they executed a poisoner early, and they go, sick, Minions are dead, but just looking for the demon. And I think even in that, that wouldn't really help you narrow it down that much. I think the Undertaker is better in a bigger game. So then we would want something like maybe a protector here. Maybe, especially because we have the poisoner, like the monk could be good here, right? This is our eight player game. We have two first night info characters. We have our one outsider. We have our virgin that'll confirm a good player. We have our empath that gets each night info which could also be the fortune teller which could could be the undertaker but if i'm playing the undertaker i don't want it to be the only each night info character the undertaker being the only each night info character doesn't help you find the demon whereas the empath and the fortune teller do so if you're playing a two each night info character game which is the undertaker and the fortune teller and the fortune teller is drunk it's pretty unlikely the good team can solve the game they don't have anything that's going to find it, right? But if your good team is getting smashed and your fortune teller is the drunk or is poisoned, I would say they would correctly find the demon if they selected them. Because they're like so far behind, they don't have any other info that's going to help them solve the game. They need any help that they can get at this point. Um, so I think this is more what we want to be looking at. When, when you're thinking about setting up a game for this, you need to look at... How does the good team build trust? How does the good team find the demon? And then the evil team is, how does the evil team prevent the good team from doing these two things? It shouldn't be, how, what is the evil team doing? And then how is the good team going to survive this? You need to have a solid good team first and then a good like a destruction of that from the evil team. It's It doesn't quite work the other end. Like if the evil team is really, really powerful, like if we have the spy here, right? and the fortune teller will never gets good information and the undertaker learns whatever they want. They execute the spy, but they remember what's in the grimoire. They execute the spy and the undertaker sees a trusted good player. Or the spy hits the virgin and is a trusted good player. The evil team would win this game, is my hunch, right? Um, which is really tough. I know I have my two outsiders here. That, that butler would be something different, but we're just talking about hypotheticals at this point. Um, let's try something different. Let's go for a bigger game. Let's go... Um, let's go 11 for one outsider. Okay, so 11 is one outsider, two minion. Um, I still want to start... I, I want to talk a lot about spy rack ups because uh, I've been going and playing, starting playing again regularly, and you just don't see it, right? Any games that have mixed new players and, and old players, or just new players, you don't tend to see the spy. And then the, the advanced players or whatever that have played a few times aren't playing Trouble Brewing. So the spy doesn't see enough play in my opinion. So I think that showing off some ways to use the spy where even if the player playing looks at the Grimoire and sees Biscuits, that they still have a line that they know what they can do. The other thing is that when I show a player the Grimoire as the spy, I'll point to them, right? So that they know where they are in the circle. I'll be like, this, this spy is you, right? And then I might go, oh, see this washerwoman, where's my washerwoman token? This washerwoman saw you, right? And then point at that thing. So when the washerman comes up to you and goes, hey, are you this character? You say yes, or whatever. So helping them understand what the information of the Grimoire is trying to tell them as best you can. Because if your first time playing the spy, you look at the Grimoire, you've never story told it before, you're like, what am I looking at? What is this, right? And any, any help <laughs> that you can give that player, especially because the spy can be super passive, giving them something so they have that choice to be passive or active, I think, 
is important. So for our, I believe I said an 11 player game, we're gonna have one outsider, have our one outsider, we get two minions. So we're gonna get, I think Baron, I think Baron might be a bit rude here. I, we're gonna say Scarlet Woman, all right? We're gonna get Scarlet Woman, Imp, Spy, that's our, and then our default outsider is the butler. And I might change it as I need to. My, my table cloth is wrinkly. That might be a bit better. Okay, so we've got four. We now need seven, seven other characters. So these seven other characters are going to be townsfolk. So I think the Raven Keeper is good here. I think Fortune Teller. Fortune Teller is a fantastic character, right? Because it, I believe, it balances fairly no matter the number of players in the game. If there's a lot of players in the game, they have to use their ability multiple times to potentially hit a target. If there is fewer characters in the game, they're more likely to hit the red herring and the demon and have a 50-50, which is fantastic. Um, whereas the empath, the empath in a smaller player game is more likely to scan every single player. Whereas the empath in a bigger player game could maybe scan half the players as their neighbors change, right? And these are the kind of things that you want to have in mind as you're building building a rack up, knowing what kind of combination of seeding these characters could have. Like if the empath is next to the entire evil team, if the empath is between the Scarlet Woman and the Imp, that could be bad. And I don't have a drunk in the setup to be able to solve this problem. However, the empath between the spy and the Scarlet Woman or the spy and the Imp means I can change the info however I want because the spy might register as good or not. And then I can make the empath think they're the drunk or that they've been poisoned. And that gives me some freedom to not just dunk on the evil team the entire game. Um, whereas the fortune teller, wherever they're seated, doesn't matter as much. Um, I feel like the investigator, actually, this would be really funny, right? We have the investigator and the washwoman, and they both see the spy. <laughs> the investigator sees the spy as the spy, and the washwoman sees the spy as the townsfolk, right? Um, I have run games before for a new player where I've gone, the washwoman has seen, like I go, this is the washwoman, this spy is you, right? This is what they've seen you as, so that they kind of know exactly what's going on. Um, but I wouldn't do that for an advanced player. I would rely on an advanced player to negotiate in such a way in which they felt like they successfully bluffed that person into believing them. In this scenario, that's gonna be way harder to do because you have an investigator that's seen you as a spy. I would also point that investigator at an each night info character. So maybe the undertaker, right? The investigator sees the spy or the undertaker as the spy. Really, really strong. Then the washerwoman sees the spy as whatever townsfolk, which could also be hilarious. Um, one of the other ones I've done is librarian sees the spy and an each night info character as the drunk which is also helpful, uh, especially in a zero outsider game, because the librarian goes, I exist, there must be a baron, there's outsiders. Someone is a drunk, and then one of like the, the spy goes, well, I, I'm the outsider, I'm the butler, guys, right? And then it easily builds this world narrative from this one choice that you made, setting the rank up. It's, as a storyteller, you, you just throw a bunch of stuff in there, and yes, the game's gonna be chaotic, but you can't guarantee that it's gonna be balanced. If you set up a rack up and you kind of know how certain chunks of the game are gonna play out, you then have this 50-50 on each one, where it's like 50-50, this goes positive, this is gonna to lean towards this way. 50-50, this goes negative, it's gonna to lean towards this way, right? With this particular example, the 50-50 is really obvious. It goes either the washerwoman is the one that's trusted, and the, the washerwoman and the spy are believed to be good players, which I would say leans more towards the evil team having an advantage. If the investigator um, goes, yeah, 100%, I believe that you're the spy that the washerwoman has picked up as part of their ability, then the spy gets executed and the good team is now leading, right? And that could go either way. That's entirely dependent on how the spy negotiates on the how much the investigator believes the <laughs> undertaker or the spy right because they're both good good candidates i'm the investigator i go up to the undertaker i'm like hey can you claim a character to me because i saw you as something and they're like oh hmm, well uh i'm the undertaker and then the investigator is like oh only every every spy in every game has claimed to be the undertaker 
um, which would be really interesting, right? So we've got our day one core that sets off the game. And then we'd be looking at what kind of other information we can add to this. So this is our four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So we can get rid of one. Right, so we have there three each night info characters, which is probably a bit strong. If that was the case, I would make one of them the drunk. Uh, making the Undertaker drunk would be super mean. If I thought that the spy was a super duper new player, having an Undertaker with shit information who's trying to be the spy could go either way. Uh, having an empath be the drunk, depending on who they're sitting next to, also pretty fine. This is probably not a game that I would put the virgin in because we already have the investigator and the washerwoman seeing the spy. The spy nominating the virgin and triggering would be really unhelpful. Um, this would probably be a good game for a slayer or a mare. Let's start with a mare here, all right? So, so with the mayor, everyone goes, oh my God, there's so much stuff happening around the spy. I'm so confused about what's going on. But the spy and the demon can't do anything about the mayor. As a storyteller, you go, I'm gonna bounce every single shot because I believe the mayor is critical to the good team winning. I want the mayor alive on the final day. And the mayor's job is to get as many people to trust them and to ignore as much of the evil team noise as possible, right? So on the final day, Everyone is like, okay, I don't know who I'm trusting, but if I trust the mayor, we can go for that win con. Or if I have a hunter on who I think the demon is, we can go for that person instead, uh, which I think also would be interesting. Um, and then a lot of stuff like the chef. The chef's power is impossible to know until everyone's seating has been shown on the grimoire, right? In an 11 player game, the chef seeing Two is insane. Uh, without a recluse, seeing a two is insane. Um, so like, the Undertaker sees one evil player and they're like, right, I don't care, we're killing your neighbors. The chef got a two, we're killing your neighbors. Uh, and then the good team wins the game, like straight away. And sometimes that can happen. Or the empath goes from a one to a zero after killing someone uh, in a chef pay, like, okay, we kill the next person. Or, from a one to a one, okay, we kill the next person, or whatever. Um, and so these are the kind of things that you want to be thinking of when going into this like this is a game that hasn't even been played yet We don't know what's gonna happen in this game But I've just told you a whole bunch of hypothetical situations which could have happened which could have Been the way that the game played out right and now what I haven't done yet is talked about is this balance to either team which I did want to do a lot of today so this core part right with the investigator the washerwoman and the spy I think the drunk is really important to this. Um, with the spy, I think it goes either way, right? So I'm not gonna say that's advantage to either team. The Scarlet Woman, I think, doesn't super matter. I think putting the Poisoner in here would be too powerful, and I think putting the Baron in here would be too powerful. The Scarlet Woman is fine, because if the evil team messes up, if the spy is like, hey, demon, I'm gonna trust you a whole bunch, and the investigator's like, that's sus as hell, let's kill that person then the evil team doesn't lose straight away. So that means that if the spy messes up big time, it doesn't kill the game for the evil team. Um, and then the drunk, you would place the drunk wherever is most balancing. So if the empath's in a really bad spot, they might become the drunk. If the chef's gonna see a two, they are the drunk and they're seeing a zero uh, and stuff like that, right? Um, like you could have the drunk washerwoman still see the spy and I feel like there's a no outside again um, Which is also fine, but it's like a does nothing drunkenness and people are looking for an outsider that doesn't exist and Then a player claiming an outsider like the demon coming out as a butler wouldn't be terrible. Maybe we don't know um, Which is also a totally fine option so the drunk is a, a balancing tool that you move based on whether or not looking at the initial seeding chart, whether or not you think the evil team or the good team has an advantage. Um, in this, right, so if the chef would get really, really crucial info, they would be the drunk. If they would get okay or good info, they're fine. I don't think the mayor ever becomes the drunk here. I don't think the mayor becoming the drunk ever is cool or fun. It's like super anticlimactic. Um, it's like everyone go to sleep. Oh, the evil team won. Damn, 
How about that? Was there a poisoner alive? No, you were the drunk from the start. Oh, damn, that sucks. Like, I wouldn't do that. Uh, the fortune teller here could be a good drunk candidate. Um, I would probably only do that, right? If I had the empath, like, maybe between the washerman and the investigator or between two other info characters, but not neighboring the undertaker. The, the undertaker's uh, alignment being under question is really important to this setup. Because the evil team has no misinformation, like uh, like the like poisoning or whatever, um, like uh, active active misinformation. The spy here in the setup is passive, and then what they say becomes active misinformation. So I can't bank on how well they're going to play the spy unless if I'm looking at the seeding chart and I know that, like I've accidentally given Evan the spy. Whoops, he's probably going to run away with the game on it, right? And so, we're kind of going to look at this. The way it stands right now, the fortune teller being drunk, um, I think this is probably fine. Maybe leaning towards the evil team. Depending on how... Depending on where the empath is seated, depending on where the evil team is seated for the chef, and how the undertaker goes. Um, I think if I'm really worried that the evil team is going to run away with it, I would make the chef drunk and give them close to good information. Like, if, it, if there was one pair of your players, giving the chef a two would be really funny. Um, making the Empath drunk, I would only do if they're next to two evil players. And making the Undertaker drunk and giving them some correct information and some misinformation, I think would also be fine. Um, depending on how the Investigator and the Spy uh, interact with each other. So, this is our more players, slightly more advanced setup. Uh, and let's, let's do another one. So we keep the imp. I'm gonna pull out everything so I don't reuse things too much. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of characters here that haven't been used, and you might notice that they're all pretty passive. Uh, Raven's Keeper, Monk of the Protector. So I have two protectors that I didn't want to use either time, but we'll get to why and when for them. We have the Slayer, we have the Librarian, and we have the Virgin. Or which weren't used. So let's try and put them in again. I wouldn't recommend playing all the not played characters two in a row. Some people meta read what you put in the bag. If it's like, oh, we're not going to have a one of these every single game or whatever. Or Keith doesn't put the butler in the game or all this kind of stuff based on what the storyteller does. And a lot of the times we always say is you shouldn't make assumptions on what the storyteller is going to do because, and especially if it's me, because I'm going to make choices directly contradicting what your assumptions are going to be so that you have a more interesting game. And then you announcing what your assumptions are about me as a storyteller gives me information to make you have a bad time. <laughs> Basically, put put you in a corner for my own amusement. So it's better off that you just... Every game's fresh, right? I'm putting in whatever I think is going to be the most balanced, fun time for players. And I think that's important. I think that's the thing that the meta read is like, what would be fun? What, what would be interesting for, to happen right now, right? Um, okay, so if this is an 11 player game again, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six townsfolk. I need my two minions. I'm not gonna put the spy in every single time. Um, if we go Baron Poisoner, right, Baron Poisoner. Uh, Baron gives us two outsiders which is gonna be the butler and the saint. Kind of a big meme. One of the other things is that when the Baron is in play, there's this big assumption one of the outsiders is the drunk. Pretty much every time. Everyone is like, oh, one outsider, one drunk, any other, one of the two out outsiders is lying, all right? Which I think is super interesting. So having two relatively public outsiders is going to be something that people can be like, oh my God. Um, or you have a drunk librarian in a zero player game that has a baron and the drunk librarian receives a zero. That's also really funny to me. Um, so if you make this a 10 player game, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. We'll take out the virgin. This is a 10 player game. It's supposed to be zero outsiders by default. Two minions. The baron puts in two outsiders. Um, no, it would have to be an 11 player game so that I can have the drunk. And the drunk is the librarian. All right, so the drunk librarian sees a zero instead of a one, which seems wrong. It doesn't quite work the way I want it to. Damn it. Damn it. 
Okay, so instead, <laughs> so we, we, I'm probably gonna change the version for something else. Uh, but we lose the butler, big sad. We have a 10 player game. We have a 10 player game. The librarian is a drunk that saw a zero. The baron put in two outsiders in a play, which is the drunk and the saint. But the librarian thinks there's no outsiders in the game. And there's no outsiders by default, which is really suspicious. The librarian that wakes up in a game that's not supposed to have outsiders, and you get a zero, you're doubting your entire life. You're like, what is going on here, all right? Which I think would be really funny. Especially if this is all advanced players, they get to be like so in the tank about this. Like you don't even have a Baron, you have nothing. You have, I don't know, one outsider or something. Some way for them to be the drunk. Or you just put them in a game. Yeah, so there's no outsiders, there's nothing. They get correct information, there's zero outsiders in the game. And they're like, but I knew that already. What is he trying to tell me? <laughs> what I mean. Which would be really mean, and I probably wouldn't do that. Unless if they were a super advanced player that I had beef with. You know who you are. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I probably wouldn't do that. Um, so here we have our two outsiders for the Baron, and we have the Poisoner. I think the Poisoner um, is probably too strong here, right? So we have way... We have like no info right now, okay? We have the Slayer that gets a 1 in 10 shot of hitting the Demon. We have the chef that gives us information about pets. We have the soldier and the monk. Now I think putting the soldier and the monk in the same game isn't going to be great. Either it slows down the game a lot and then people get grumpy because there's no real traction. There's several knights with no deaths and the demon hasn't figured out who the monk is yet or whatever. And so I'll probably take one of these out. I think the monk is more interactive. I'm a big advocate for players having more choices and being able to do things. So I think the monk would be a, a more interesting character to play here. I think the Raven's Keeper is fine. So what are we down to? We are down to nine, so I need to put in one info character. Now, looking at the board the way that it is, this info character is gonna be the fortune teller. Because the good team doesn't have a lot of each night info, in fact, it doesn't have a lot of info at all, it has the librarian that's getting shit info. It has the chef that's gonna get something but like the chef only only helps you find the evil team based on who who you think has died or who you think is claiming. So like a recluse and a chef one is a lightning rod for the recluse's neighbors to die. Uh, an undertaker seeing a dead um, evil player is uh, a lightning rod for a chef pair to, to kill those neighbors, right? Uh, I had a game recently where as the Undertaker, I saw the imp that we executed and the game didn't end. And I was like, oh, I was drunk that day. When in reality, the imp did get himself killed knowing he had a Scarlet Woman. Um, and I don't think there was a chef in that game. But you're always, playing as the chef, you're always like, okay, is this person sitting next to someone evil? Do we think this person was a minion? Is the demon potentially one of the people next to them? And stuff like that. Um, but I don't think it could point the way to the demon as much as something like the fortune teller would. If the fortune teller wasn't there, the chef isn't enough to find the demon. The fortune teller being there can find the demon on their own. The empath being there can find the demon on their own. The undertaker can't. I feel like the fortune teller or the empath, you should have at least one not getting, like not being the drunk in each game. Uh, like just to kind of have something happening that way. So you're not waking up at night, tapping the demon, they kill someone, and then everybody wakes up. Okay, so we've got the Raven Keeper, which could be good, could be bad. The evil team doesn't have any way of really stopping the Raven Keeper from doing stuff. So if the Raven Keeper plays well, they can they can sort of do what the Virgin would do, but potentially scan an evil player. Uh, but they can confirm someone in their death. Like the Raven Keeper and the Virgin work very similar. And playing both, um, and they both trigger, can be really strong. But it's pretty unlikely that both would trigger in a game. Uh, the Monk and the Raven's Keeper don't work very well together. The Monk protecting the Raven, like, if the Raven Keeper comes out with a bluff that they think is gonna make the demon kill them, and the Monk hears that, they're like, oh, I better protect this guy, is really bad. Um, that might be something that I would advocate for using a soldier instead if I felt like the, the Raven Keeper problem was gonna happen there. 
uh, and then we have the same this whole rack up is about the librarian and the saint fighting and the evil team encouraging that which i think is interesting right um because everyone's like there's not supposed to be any outsiders there has to be a baron and the librarian's like there's not supposed to be any outsiders um which is like also super weird like this same you have to look at what world views the players are going to build here right so either this setup is the exact worldview that they have you go okay i'm the librarian i was supposed to confirm the saint but i've been poisoned there must be a poisoner in the game or and which is much 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 less likely this is a 10 player game there's no outsiders and there's no baron and the evil team is trying to set up a worldview where there is a baron and there's outsiders in play by claiming the saint and implying someone is drunk uh, which you know could work but because there's a librarian in the game <laughs> and there's a librarian that got a zero what would have to happen is that they wouldn't come up with that independently me as a storyteller would have to give a bunch of outsiders as bluffs to the demon for them to go yeah that's what i'm going to do and the librarian's like i got a zero which would be super unfair to the demon if that was just straight up the case right if there wasn't anything else there but i feel like that that is a setup that would add lots of doubt Lots of confusion to like what's really going on with the setup, rather than what the evil team's doing or what the good team's doing. So that's probably something I would do for a more advanced group. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't run this for a bunch of beginner people. Um, but yeah, let's let's pick up another one. Let's look at um, let's start somewhere different, shall we? So I haven't used the soldier. I'll probably find a place that I haven't used the recluse yet. Okay. So the other thing is that um, I think ten players, nine, you don't get two minions, and you have two outsiders, which kind of sucks because if you play the baron, that's like ridiculously painful. Um, at ten, you get your two minions. At eleven. It's probably the ideal number because you have a little bit of everything, right? Um, so for 11, we have our imp. Let's go poisonous spy, right? So poisonous spy, just from this alone, tells me I want to have a lot of info in the game. A lot of info in the game for the evil team to try and refute. So we're gonna go investigator. I think empath is good here. I think fortune teller also good here. I think Undertaker would be hilarious. Um, so this is our, what are we doing, like 11? So it's four, five, six, seven. Yeah, four more, one outsider, and one outsider. I'm probably the drug, so I'm just gonna put him here for now. Um, and then now we want some first night info. So I think the recluse might work better here. And the chef, so we have like a really high chance so the chef, the recluse, and the spy. The spy can register as not evil, the recluse can register as evil. So I just have so much freedom with what info I wanna to give to give the chef. So if we have the rack up exactly as listed, we have potentially four evil people in a row, and I can give the chef a three. And the chef's like, probably poison, you know? Or I wanna kill the entire side of the table that's near the recluse. Um, which is kind of crazy. And that would be kind of funny. Like if, if they're all split up and the poisoner hits the chef, me knowing that it could be a big number, you know, I might show them a big number and make them freak out, which kind of would be funny. I think also showing them a two as a big number would be really interesting. Um, and then we don't have a drunk, which is interesting, but I would want, I would show the fortune teller, the recluse as a yes every single time um, I'm not sure what I would do with the investigator just yet. Let's see what other characters we get in here first. So we have eight, nine, I need two more townsfolk. I don't like putting the Slayer in the Recluse game because people are always like, you're the Slay the Recluse. That might do what the Raven's Keeper or the Virgin already does. And you're like, I don't want to do that because the Slayer is supposed to try and kill the demon. That's their whole point. That's what makes this character good. 
stop finding other shitty ways to make this character less than good and there's two other characters that already do that thing um and i don't have a lot i could chef or investigator are good virgin targets and the spy has the option to hit the virgin as well so i think the virgin is pretty good here instead of the slayer is trying to confirm someone and then having something like the soldier could work because the, the soldier in this case works as a really good uh, kind of a patsy for the evil team. Because they get to the end of the game, their ability is never triggered because it's super obvious, right? And actually, <laughs> if I'm the soldier and my neighbor turns to me and goes, I'm the virgin, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna nominate you. I'm gonna nominate you and the Undertaker uh, is gonna read me and not see top four. And I think that would be really interesting because I, go, I talk to everyone and the Undertaker's like, I saw you as a soldier and I trust that person really, really implicitly. And it's really unlikely that the spine will double claim someone because uh, uh, they out that there's a spy in the game. I think the spy's best job is to keep the fact that a spy exists hidden. That's how you gotcha people because they're like, oh, it must be a poison on my info is wrong. Or, uh, you know what I mean? Or someone is a drunk hero or whatever because there might be a baron or something like that. If you have the spy claiming the Undertaker and the Undertaker claiming the Undertaker giving the exact same info, that's kinda, kinda awkward. And really detracts from who the demon is. I don't know that that would be very helpful. And it kind of tells everyone that there has to be a spy in the game. Um, but the soldier nominating the Virgin would be interesting to me. Um, I would have the Recluse Sharp as Evil for each of the Each Knight characters, abilities. Um, just as much as I would show the Spy is a good player, probably. Because we have a lot of Each Knight info characters from the good team. But also depending on what the Poisoner hits. Like if the Poisoner hits the Fortune Teller, and the Fortune Teller picks the Recluse, I'd probably show a no. If, if the Poisoner is has hit another info character that was supposed to get very good information and they didn't, I would be more likely to be lenient with how other stuff reads, right? Like if the spy got executed during the day by nominating the virgin and the poisoner hit the fortune teller that night, I would show the undertaker that a spy was executed. Um, which I think would be really interesting. How bad would that be? You're the spy? You're like, yeah, okay, that's a virgin. I'm gonna try talk to a few people and then talk to them and then nominate them. I'm gonna pretend to be uh, a washwoman, probably, confirming the demon or something like that. Or the librarian that saw the recluse. And then I, you know, I get I get executed from the nomination. And then an undertaker comes out and goes, yeah, that was a spy. <laughs> like, shit. Got me. My one job. I was so sneaky. Um and what else have we got? We've got the investigator that I haven't really picked who I want to scan yet. Now, you have you have levels of how mean you want to be, right? Super duper mean here would be the investigator hitting the recluse as a not in play minion. Um, hitting the recluse as a baron would be really interesting. Um, and then showing the soldier as the baron as the second pair I think would be fine if I think the evil team needs a lot of help. Somewhere in the middle would be the investigator showing the poisoner and probably the undertaker. Um, or if you wanted to do a false positive, you do the poisoner and the recluse. That's probably more towards in the evil team's favor, I think. And then more more towards the good team's sign would be the investigator seeing the spy and someone that probably isn't the spy. Someone that's happy to die and confirm they're not the spy. Which I'd only do if the evil team was stacked with good players. Um, with experienced players. But then also, because there's like a lot of poisoning on top of what, what can read the spy. I wouldn't want the spy and the recluse to read incorrectly too often if the poisoner is just hitting all the time. You know what I mean? Um, which I think is interesting here. Um, let's do one more. But we're going to do... No, let's do a couple more, but we're going to do a different set. We're going to move to Sex and Violets. Oops, I just put all my minions in the demon's spot. 